All right, moving on, we're now in part four on corruptions of Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to creationliberty.com, type in the word witness, W-I-T-N-E-S-S, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. That should get you to an article called, again, Corruptions of Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses. Or if you're listening by YouTube, you can click the link in the description and that'll take you to the article. You'll just have to scroll down to where we are. So last time we got left off talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses having to work off their salvation, where the the Watchtower tells them that they must exercise their faith and do God's will for the rest of their lives in order to get salvation. Okay. And again, as I was explaining last week, don't misunderstand what is meant by God's will. That is the will of the Watchtower, because they believe the Watchtower's will is God's will. So... What I ended talking about last week, we were, we were going to get into this book they have called You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth. So by saying that, they believe that this paradise, this is where everybody's going to go when they die. And so he says, that they called it that, you can live there, and we're going to tell you how. All right? Now, in this book, they tell people that only 144,000 people will get into heaven. Now, we're going to cover a little bit on that in a moment, so put a pen in that and keep that there. I'll, I'll get to that. The rest of those who have God's so-called, in quotation, salvation, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, will live on earth under God's government. That's supposed to be paradise. So only 144,000 people get into heaven, and everybody else goes to live on earth under God's government in this paradise. So according to this Watchtower book, there are four things you have to do to gain God's salvation and to be de declared light righteous so that you can live in paradise. So keep that in mind. Only 144,000 go to heaven, and if you want to gain access to the paradise, there are four things you've got to do. Now, the first thing that they list out is they say you need to gain the, quote, knowledge needed, end quote. In other words... You have to learn the, quote, truth of God, end quote, which most people would typically take to mean, okay, you study the Bible. Like if I say to any of you, you need to learn the truth of God, what do you think? Oh, okay, I need to go to the Bible. That's what people think, because where does our doctrine come from? The word of God. That is not what is taught to Jehovah's Witnesses. When new members join the Jehovah's Witness cult, they quickly realize that this knowledge needed that they've got to get is gained by attending five minimum mandatory one-hour meetings per week with up to 30 hours of optional activities per week that a Jehovah's Witness can choose to attend if they're really zealous, if they really want to try to get into heaven and be one of those 144,000. So... The Watchtower has made it clear to all Jehovah's Witnesses that the Watchtower Society is the light that all people must come to and serve, or they will be rejected from God's kingdom. Now, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is not what the Watchtower teaches. You might have individual Jehovah's Witnesses that will agree with you on that verse. You quote that verse to them and they agree with you, but that is not what the Watchtower teaches. From the book, You Can Live on Forever in Paradise on Earth from 1982, it says, quote, And there will be only one organization, God's visible organization, that will survive the fast approaching Great Tribulation. Now, when they say God's visible organization, that means the Watchtower Society. That's how that's interpreted. They don't like to tell you directly what these things mean. They like to let you infer certain things. So they'll say God's visible organization, right? Now, I don't like to use the terms organization and all that concerning the church because that's what, I mean, that it also implies legal terms that I don't even want to get into on some of that stuff. And that's a whole nother matter. But if God has a visible people on this earth, the Bible calls it the church, the body of Christ, not God's visible organization, okay? So what those terms that they come up with, they always mean something, but they have their own dictionary to those things. So you need to keep that in mind when you're talking with a Jehovah's Witness. When they say something that sounds odd or sounds a little off, 
you probably want to question them on that. Exactly what do you mean by this? And keep an eye on that stuff because a lot of this stuff, it's not that even some of them are trying to trick you, but they have been so brainwashed by the people who are trying to trick you that they're just going to repeat what they've been told. So you have to make sure you get these things defined. Anyway, it continues and says, you must be part of Jehovah's organization, that is the Watchtower. They say doing God's will, which is the will of the Watchtower, in order to receive his blessings of everlasting life, end quote. Now, let me repeat that for you. They said you must be a part of Jehovah's organization doing God's will in order to receive his blessings of everlasting life. Well, that means in order to gain everlasting life, you have to do a bunch of works. That's what that means. If you go to the Watchtower publication, February 15th, 1983, it says, quote, Jehovah is using only one organization today to accomplish his will. To receive everlasting life in the earthly paradise, we must identify that organization and serve God as part of it, end quote. So, guess what they say is God's organization? You have to become a Jehovah's Witness under the Watchtower Society and do a bunch of their works or you cannot enter God's kingdom. That's what that's teaching. From the Watchtower publication, April 1st, 1983. Quote, These apostates, now again, who are apostates? Pretty much anybody who's not a part of Jehovah's Witnesses. More specifically, they're going to be referring to born-again Christians like you guys listening, like to myself. These apostates have gone out from us because they were not of our sort. Hence, they no longer have fellowship with loyal anointed witnesses of Jehovah and their companions. And therefore, these self-seeking heretics... Let me stop right there. The self-seeking heretics. Right. Because... You know, we, we teach the Word of God, we're hated among men, we are teaching Jehovah's Witnesses when we get the opportunity for the salvation of their souls, we are asking nothing from them. Our church and, and the members of the body of Christ in our church do not, we don't go out and say, oh, hey guys, why don't you join our church and do a bunch of works for us? We don't demand anything of them. We don't demand money, we don't demand works, we don't demand any of that stuff from them, but we're just self-seeking heretics, right? That's what they say. They say, therefore, these self-seeking heretics have no sharing with the Father and the Son, no matter how much they may boast of having intimacy with God and Christ. Instead, they are in spiritual darkness, end quote. I just want you to understand how fervent they are on that. You have to be a part of the watchtower or you're in hell. That's it. And we are, according to them, apostates, heretics, hypocrites, self-seeking, wicked people. That's what they do over and over. They say these things. And you may want to remember that as we go through this teaching on Jehovah's Witnesses to where we are these wicked, self-seeking heretics. That's what they call us. Just wait till you see when we get to the full big picture of what's really going on inside the Jehovah's Witness organization. So Jehovah's Witnesses know that if you want to get into earthly paradise, you have to go to meetings. I know it sounds silly to some people, but according to them, you have to attend very specific meetings in order to get into heaven. Or to heaven, to them, it's God's kingdom. It's this earthly paradise, right? Now, Alan Miller, he's a former Jehovah's Witness that grew up in a Jehovah's Witness family. He, they were very strict on all the rules. He grew up with all these things. And he wrote an article of his testimony called Fade from the Truth, a tale of learning, then unlearning the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses. But he talks about the way his family had to attend these regular scheduled meetings and how they would teach this. He said, quote, the weekly five hours of meetings were referred to as the five fingers on your hand. All five were important. 
just as you wouldn't want to have less than five fingers, a good witness would not want to try and to get away with just four or less hours of these meetings every week, end quote. So in essence, what they're teaching is that if you miss one of these meetings, it's the same as cutting off one of your fingers. That's how they're teaching this. That's how much emphasis they're putting on these weekly meetings. You've got to be at these things. And there's five of them. You have to continually go to this Jehovah's Witness temple over and over and over to do this. And as I said earlier, it's not just the five meetings, one hour. They have up to 30 hours of optional meetings and labors and things that you do on top of that. And in addition to that, they have their door-to-door -door stuff, which at a certain point they are required to do on a regular basis. We'll get to all this stuff later. If you wonder why Jehovah's Witnesses are a bit high-strung, that's why. But it's not just attending meetings, okay? The knowledge needed, what it means by that, is also gained by reading Watchtower literature. The Watchtower makes it very clear to its readers that their literature is vital to their salvation. From the Watchtower publication, December 1st, 1981, it says, quote, but Jehovah God has also provided his visible organization, that is, the watchtower, his visible and discreet slave made up of spirit-anointed ones, Jehovah's Witnesses, to help Christians, and by Christians they mean themselves, Jehovah's Witnesses, in all nations to understand and apply properly the Bible in their lives. Unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, that is, watchtower literature, we will never progress along the road of life no matter how much Bible reading we do, end quote. You did not mishear me. They said, if you don't read Jehovah's Witness literature and you just read the Bible, you will never, as they said, progress along the road to life. You cannot gain eternal life, according to them, by reading the Word of God. I, I'm serious. Jehovah's Witnesses teach you can study the Bible all you want, but you will never find Jesus. You will never find the truth, the way, and the life through the Word of God alone. The Watchtower teaches that Jehovah's Witnesses, there, there's no good fruit that comes from studying the Word of God. You have to use their materials. Now, you can study the Word of God once you have their materials to find the truth. That's what they're teaching. Let me give you 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto the light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Having to read Jehovah's Witness material with a Bible, okay, is the same as Mormons. You have to read their Mormon literature with the King James Bible. You've got to have all their, you know, the Pearl of Great Price and all these different books that they have, the Book of Mormon, things that you have to read those in conjunction with it. As the Catholics will tell you, you shouldn't study the Bible on your own. This is what Catholics will teach. But rather, you need to have the priest there with you. You need to have these types of things. These are private interpretations. And the Bible, the word of the living God, has told us that no prophecy of the scripture is an, of any private interpretation. And to that, we have to thank God and give him glory for that, that he protected the poor and the, the needy, the people like us. For our protection, he has preserved his word as pure truth, that we would not have to go to any private interpreter to get this information. But from the Watchtower, June 1st, 1985, it says, quote, To turn away from Jehovah and his organization, so that's the Watchtower, to spurn the direction of the faithful and discreet slave, and to rely simply on personal Bible reading and interpretation is to become like a solitary tree in a parched land, end quote. In case you didn't understand what they mean, a solitary tree in a parched land, meaning that you're not going to get any nutrients and you're just going to dry up and die if you read the Bible. 
They just said, to rely simply on personal Bible reading and interpretation is to become like a solitary tree in a parched land. So he says, if you don't get the Watchtower literature, you will never get the truth of the Word of God. That's what they're telling you. And that you will never find Jesus. That's what they're telling you. 1 John 2.27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So after getting this so-called knowledge needed, which basically what that means is that you need to turn from your Bible and turn to Jehovah's Witnesses. The second thing you have to do is be baptized. Okay, because that was one. The second thing, you have to go through baptism. Jehovah's Witnesses do not teach that baptism is simply a commandment for Christians, right? Because what we believe is not that baptism, baptism does not save you, folks. Okay, it will not save you. You cannot be saved by your works. Baptism is a cleansing ritual. And I talk more about this. If you want to learn more about this, I talk about it in an article we have called The Biblical Understanding of Baptism, which you can find by typing the word baptism, B-A-P-T-I-S-M, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. Baptism is a reflection of the Old Testament rituals. What, what, what they would do is when a sacrifice was made, once it was done, the priest would go out and he would bathe himself, okay? And it was a cleansing ritual to be, say, okay, the sacrifice was made for sins, and now this is a ritual in which we are cleansed. And they would bathe. That is what baptism essentially is. The ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice, was made. Therefore, baptism is that cleansing ritual as the priest would do, since all of us now, there is not a Levitical priesthood, we are now all who are born again in Christ, our individual priests, each and every one of us. That's how the Bible explains it to us in the New Testament. So, anyway, get, get the article we have on that. I explain that in more detail, go over the details on that. But it's not a work which grants you salvation. It's not anything that grants you salvation. It is a, it is a commandment an ordinance, one of the very few ones that Jesus Christ gave us that we are supposed to do once we've been born again. Once we've come to repentance of our sin, which repentance again is grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing for our sin, and we come with that humble heart to the foot of the cross and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving blood, that he died and rose himself from the dead and is alive forevermore at the right hand of the Father. When we believe those things, we are born again in Christ, become his children, and then we go and are baptized as a commandment from Christ of obedience to do this. That's what that's for. There's all sorts of other people out there that say that's for a bunch of different things. That is essentially the basic understanding of it. It's not that complicated. But that's not what Jehovah's Witnesses teach. They say that baptism is a work that has to be done to gain salvation. So, they also do not baptize people in the name of the Holy Spirit. I also want to make mention of that too where we baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they do not do that. They baptize in the name of the Spirit-filled organization. Or, simply put, they're baptizing in the name of the Watchtower Society. Keep in mind, you are not being baptized in Christ if you went to Jehovah's Witnesses. If you were a Jehovah's Witness and you came out of that, you need to be baptized. Because you're coming to the faith in Christ. You had your faith in a false god. You're being born again and coming to Christ and then coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses, you need to be baptized. You can't take the Jehovah's Witness baptism because you were baptized not in the name of Christ. See, even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when there were men who were baptized in, in under John's baptism, they were required to come again and be baptized under Christ. So when you get baptized under a spirit-filled organization, you're getting baptized under the name of the Watchtower, not the name of Christ. So I just want to make sure people understand that. That's kind of a serious situation that we're taking. Not kind of. It is a serious situation that we have to take seriously, okay? The third thing that Jehovah's Witnesses need to gain salvation and enter God's kingdom is what they call, quote, righteous conduct, end quote. In other words, you have to do good works to get in. 
you have to obey and keep all the commandments of God. And just to remind people, all these steps I'm getting, I'm getting this out of the book, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth. That's where this is coming from. So it's a Watchtower approved publication that they still hand out to this day. All right. Now, they say you have to obey and keep all of God's commandments, which the Bible has told us already, and we already went over that last week. If you remember Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Okay, so if that's, if that's true, which we do believe it is, then obeying and keeping all the commandments of God for salvation cannot work. The Bible says you cannot do that. But they say, if you don't, and not just the commandments of God, but you have to keep all the watchtower commandments or you can't enter God's kingdom. That's what they believe. Which means, by the way, that attending those weekly meetings is considered, quote, righteous conduct, end quote. Now, the fourth requirement to gain salvation and enter God's kingdom is to demonstrate loyalty to God's government. Well, how do you do that? Well, how they define it is that you have to go door to door to pass out watchtower literature and convince others to join the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's how it's defined. From that book, You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth, it says, quote, the subjects of God's government must tell others about it, end quote. So that is what they mean by demonstrating loyalty to God's government is by going door to door. And they have a quota they have to meet. We'll get to that later. But they have a certain amount of hours every week they have to spend going door to door. So just to give an example, if a man was in a hospital, let's say he was rapidly dying of an illness, he may only have a few hours to live. And he had a repentant heart toward God. And a Jehovah's Witness was there. And he asked the Jehovah's Witness, how can I be saved? The Jehovah's Witness would have to tell him to do four things. Well, if you want to be saved, you first have to study Watchtower approved Bible version and attend our weekly meetings every, every single week. You also have to be baptized in a location that is Watchtower approved and you must be baptized in the name of the Watchtower. You have to keep all the commandments of God that's written in the law and keep all the Watchtower Society's commandments, so we'll have to teach you all those as well. And then you also have to tell others about Jehovah's Witnesses and pass out literature every week to be saved. If he doesn't do those things, well, the dying man cannot gain salvation from God and he will be not be admitted to Jehovah's kingdom. Folks, this was actually explained by Jesus in the parable he gave where the, if you remember the guy that he told the story, the parable of the guy who owned the vineyard or whatever it was, it was a farm he had and the, there were people that were waiting up by this wall as a place, a common place where people would go to get hired. If you need extra hiring help, you can go to hire people and do that. So he would, he went out in the morning, found some guys to hire. He says, I'll give you a penny's wage. Now go do work. Then he hired some more people at noon. He says, I'll give you a penny's wage. Go do the work. Now keep in mind, the, the Jewish workday ends at 6 o'clock. So then he found some people at the last hour. It was 5 o'clock, one hour before closing. He says, I'll give you a penny's wage. Go out and do work. Now the people who started early in the morning, they came back and they complained. They say, but we got the same wage they did. How is that fair? But Jesus was talking about the context of salvation in that. Don't misunderstand. Those who get up early and do the work, and they've done the work their whole lives, they will get reward in heaven. But the point of that parable is to explain to people, if there's a dying man on his bed, and he comes to repentance, and he has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will save him because God is ever merciful. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9. So, because we serve such a merciful God, he will do that for someone. And even though they didn't do all the work, they still get the same penny. That penny being the salvation of Christ. And so, therefore, we praise God, even if a man has never done a lick of work for the kingdom of God, nothing like that. And he dies the last, or he is saved the last minute before he dies. We can praise God for that. 
that he went on to heaven. Now, he won't get the reward that somebody who's worked their whole lives have, right? That like Peter in Scripture, he won't get the same reward that Peter is getting or that Paul is getting or John or James or anybody that owes God or Stephen, you know, take your pick. He's not going to get the same reward, but he will get salvation and live with Christ and the rest of the church, all the born-again believers and all those throughout the history of the world who are faithful in God. We will live with them for eternity. So, it's not about works. Works is something we ought to do because we are, number one, bought with a price. Jesus bought us with a very heavy price, and we ought to honor that. And number two, that we receive reward in heaven. Whether it's charity, whether it's resistance of sin and, and turning from it, whatever it is, there is reward in heaven for these things. But the foundation a man has to lay has to be in Christ Jesus, not in the Watchtower Society. And even if a dying man had a repentant heart, a faithful Jehovah's Witness must tell him that it's impossible for him to be saved and condemn him to eternal punishment, if they're going to be honest. I just praise God that <laughs> he is nothing like the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses. 2 Timothy Chapter 1 and verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before the world began. So as we just read some of these examples, Jehovah's Witnesses are looking to get into paradise, not heaven. Now this is because Jehovah's Witnesses teach that heaven is only reserved for 144,000 people. Now this is based on a false interpretation of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4. It says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, they say, well look, this 144,000, that's all the people that are getting into heaven. Let me read this one more time. I heard the number of them which were sealed. There were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. In fact, I tell you what, I'm going to go, let me go back to this Bible. This Bible, the Bible. Let me go back to the Bible. And I'll show you in Revelation chapter 7, that was verse 4. Here's verse 5. It says, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Okay? If you add all these up, it comes out to 144,000. But verse 5 is Judah, Reuben, Gad. Verse 6 is Asher, Nephilim, and Manassas. Verse 7 is Simeon, Levi, and Issachar. Verse 8 is Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Is there something that's really difficult to understand about that? It's talking specifically of the children of Israel here. This has nothing to do with, okay, here this is the total amount of people that's getting into heaven. That is not what that says. But that's what Jehovah's Witnesses teach because they're cherry-picking verses out of their context and coming up with whatever they want. Now, the Watchtower Online Library at jw.org in an article they have that says, Why did Jehovah's Witnesses take the number 144,000 mentioned in the book of Re Revelation literally and not symbolically? Okay, well, first of all, stop for just a second. I'm taking it literally too. Literally that it applies to the children of Israel. And this is talking about the tribes of the children of Israel. I'm not taking this symbolically. I take it literally. It's the Jehovah's Witnesses that are taking it symbolically. They're saying, oh, this actually represents all those who go to heaven. But yet they're trying to claim that they take it literally. You see, it's actually confusing even what they state that they're doing. But in this article, they say, quote, In the Bible, the phrase, those who were sealed, refers to a group of individuals who are chosen from among mankind to rule with Christ in heaven over the coming paradise earth, end quote. So the purpose of heaven, according to them, is to be in charge of how paradise is ruled over, which will be earth, according to them. It's earth under God's kingdom. 
like God's ruling authority. That's what it's supposed to be. But then all the all the special 144,000 people, they get to go there. So the Bible does not say this anywhere whatsoever. Now, they're going to attempt to back up this claim. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses will make some effort. Now, they go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting in verse 21, it says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now it says he sealed us, right? And they said, oh, well, if he sealed us, and it says, look, they're sealed over here, and there's 144,000, therefore there's only 144,000 sealed. There, what? The context, there's no context that connects any of that. What they did is almost like the, the what I talk about, the, the Bible study by keyword search, which is what a lot of people are doing nowadays and thinking that's a Bible study. They took in two places where the word sealed was and just assumed they're talking about the same thing. I've seen people do that kind of stuff countless times on countless subjects. There's so many false doctrines that come out of it because they don't understand the basis of doctrine. Because again, what does it require? It requires study of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That's the most important thing. You can study the Bible all you want all your life, but if you don't have the Spirit of God being born again in Him, you will never understand the fullness of that book. So what they're missing is that in Revelation 7-4, it's talking about the Jews, but in first, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1, Paul is talking to the Gentiles in Corinth. So the only way you can confuse those two contexts is if you do so willingly. That's willful ignorance, willful blindness. If you go back and read the entirety of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll notice that it does not mention anything about the last days like Revelation 7 does. So they're not the same context. Because Jehovah's Witnesses believe that only 144,000 are going to heaven... Most are simply trying to earn their way into this paradise because they're like, oh, I don't think I could ever be selected and ever be holy enough to go to be part of that 144,000. And if only 144,000 are going, and by the way, Revelation was written like, what, 2,000 years ago? So how do you know that the 144,000 are not already, the slots are all taken up? How do you know that's not the case? So most sit back and think, wow, there's no way I'd be able to get into that heaven spot. I just couldn't be holy and righteous enough to get that spot there. And so they, they try to work as much as they can just to live in the paradise on earth, God's kingdom on earth. That's what they want to do. And Jehovah's Witnesses have no idea who's going to be among those 144,000. They also have no idea how to have an idea of who's going or not. And that's something you'll commonly see in cults. They'll say, oh, who really gets to go to heaven, like directly to heaven? Well, you know, we don't really know, but you just got to do a lot of work. Just like, it's like how Catholics don't know even if the Pope is going to heaven. They don't really even know that either. Nobody knows. How long does it take to get out of purgatory? Uh, well, we don't know, so you better do a lot that you can now. And I, I did a demotivational poster on that where I just took the uh, the old commercials for what how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop and the world may never know. <laughs> That's kind of it's the same thing. Like how much work do you have to do to get into God's earthly kingdom for Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, the world may never know, but nobody knows how much you got to do. So to give an example of how fervently Jehovah's Witnesses believe this, I once listened to the testimony of an ex-Jehovah's Witness who talked about a mother and teenage daughter in their their temple, like their Jehovah's Witness temple. They were discussing the paradise versus heaven issue in their congregation. Now the mother, I think it was like later that week or something, she had come back and said that she had been given a revelation that she was going to be one of the 144,000 who would rule in heaven. And everybody's like, oh, wow. Oh. But the daughter was furious. She was angry, and she was angry with the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? Because she would be separated from her mother for all eternity. You see, the 144,000, they get separated from the rest of those in paradise. They live in two different places. 
and they can't go to each other. So according to Jehovah's Witness doctrine, her mother, this daughter and her mother would be separated for all eternity, and she was angry with the Jehovah's Witness God about this. So can you at least start, some of you start to see why Jehovah's Witnesses, they experience so much burden and stress in their lives? There's a reason for it. Anybody that's got to do a bunch of works to try to get into heaven is burdened heavily. I mean, when you never know how much work you've got to do to earn that ticket, it's hopelessness. It's going to be next to impossible to do enough work to be in the 144,000 of Jehovah's Witnesses, not knowing if... And, and of course, here's the question you have to ask on top of that. Since the Jehovah's Witness organization really did not appear until Charles Russell started all this in the late 1800s, then what about everybody before then? Was nobody of Christ? Was nobody able to get into that 144,000? Because they didn't know about it? Because after all, they weren't handing out Jehovah's Witness liter and tra literature and tracts, so what about them? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Ultimately, what this does, it creates a burden of despair that results in Jehovah's Witnesses suffering an extraordinary amount of depression and anxiety. It's very common amongst Jehovah's Witness households, and we'll cover more on that later. There's many types of people. Now, there's lots of different religions that teach against, you know, there's, I guarantee you, there's Catholics that do this, Mormons do this, Jehovah's Witnesses do this, preach against the use of drugs to calm anxiety. But you'd be surprised how many people that are in all these cultic institutions who take them to help even out their anxieties. Because, I mean, especially in Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got so much to do. And basically, they keep you so busy in the Jehovah's Witnesses, you don't even have time to think about the truth. You don't have time to study the Bible and sit down with it, because they keep you so busy. The Watchtower teaches that all must come to the Jehovah's Witnesses organization to gain salvation. And the Watchtower publication, November 15, 1981, says, quote, And while now the witness yet includes the invitation to come to Jehovah's Organization for salvation. The time, no doubt, will come when the messages take on a harder note like a great war cry, end quote. So they say you have to come to Jehovah's Organization for salvation. If you're not a Jehovah's Witness, you can't be saved. If you don't read Watchtower literature, you can't be saved. That's what they teach. From the Watchtower publication, November 15th, 1992, they said, quote, That organization still exists, and of it a longtime witness of Jehovah said, If one thing has been most important to me, it has been the matter of keeping close to Jehovah's visible organization, which again is the Watchtower. How else can one get Jehovah's favor and blessing? There is nowhere else to go for divine favor and life eternal, end quote. They just stated, you cannot go to Jesus Christ and get salvation, which is pretty much what most of the cults teach. Just like, you know, for example, compare it to Catholics. Catholics teach that too. No, 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 you got to go to the priest and then you got to go to Mary. You can't go to Jesus Christ. That's what they teach. That... They teach here, there's nowhere else to go but Jehovah's visible organization. You have to go to the Watchtower and get salvation from the Watchtower or you can't get it at all. And they get so brainwashed with this thought when you tell them that the gift of eternal life is free and that repentance and faith is how it's acquired. They in their minds thinking it can't be that simple. It just can't be that simple. And they say that because they do not do not trust in Jesus Christ. They have no faith in him. We have faith in Jesus Christ that he made it that simple because we are weak and poor and blind and wretched and naked. We are pathetic in our state, and he has made this simple for us. The more I've studied scripture, there is a lot of stuff hidden in different layers and all sorts of things the way God set it up. But once you understand it, the doctrine is so incredibly simple. The doctrines of Christ are incredibly simple for the most part. And he did that for us in our lowly state 
that we don't have lots of, you know, you don't have to have the super intelligent rocket scientist brain surgeon mind to be able under, to understand his word. But that's what Jehovah's Witnesses teach. You can't go to Jesus. You got to go to them and you got to work it off. So again, to Jehovah's Witnesses, I will requote Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus speaking here. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He didn't say go learn watchtower literature. He says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. You're not going to find rest in the watchtower. You're not going to find it in Jehovah's Witness temples. Only through Jesus Christ will you find rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So now we're going to move on to a section called Using the Force in Luke. Why did I call it that? This is basically a play on words in reference to the wicked movie Star Wars, okay? Because Jehovah's Witnesses actually believe that the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is just a non-living force or energy. And so what I've done is I've gone to Luke, in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 11, it says, And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought for how or what thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. Don't misunderstand. It's not talking about if you go into a courtroom for any other reason. But if you're being brought before kings and magistrates and people like that and judges, on the basis that somebody is persecuting you, and this is about the Lord Jesus Christ, over what you have taught the truth, then you should take no thought for what you should say, because what you shall say will be given to you by the Holy Spirit in that time. Because if God instituted the governments, which he did, then he will give you the answer that he gives to those governments. So that's what it's saying here. But it continues to say, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. So what they believe is that there, this Holy Ghost is a force or an energy, very much like the force that the Jedi Knights and Luke Skywalker will use, which is a very similar concept to what Gnostics believe. If you don't know what a Gnostic is, it actually doesn't really matter. Uh, everything they believe is pagan and really, really stupid, but it's witchcraft. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about the Gnosticism thing, I explain it in very brief detail in an article we have called Video Games Causing Witchcraft to Prosper. You can just type in the word game, G-A-M-E, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. You'll find that article, again, it's called Video Games Causing Witchcraft to Prosper, and we talk about it to some degree in there. So in short, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God, which means they also do not believe that God has revealed himself in three persons. Okay. Now, I'll pause here for a moment just to tell you, for those of you, if you're listening by YouTube and you wondered why I have this thumbnail of squirrels with lightsabers, it's that whole thing is based on a demotivational poster I did, where I put in a Jehovah's Witness track laying up against a tree next to a, next to a bunch of jumping squirrels with lightsabers, and I was just, the, the tract itself, or not the tract, but the... Um, the caption on the demotivational poster says, An abandoned Jehovah's Witness book allowed squirrels to gain the power of the Watchtower's Holy Spirit. Because of the very strange connection it has to, like, using the Force in Star Wars. And that's why I use the play on words, using the Force in Luke. Because of all this comes from the book of Luke. Okay, so now we all get it. We all on the same page of why I did that. There was a particular reason. I told you I'd explain it. just took time to get there. But when reading this out of Luke, it says, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you. How is it that they believe that inanimate, non-living objects teach? Or a force, a non-living, inanimate force would teach? That doesn't happen. Okay. Now, of course, you can say, well, there are non-living things that we can learn stuff from. You know, we can learn things even out of the rocks and, you know, uh, insects aren't alive. We can learn things from them because of biblical classification in Leviticus 17.11 that says the life of the flesh is in the blood and insects don't have blood. So therefore, they are not alive according to biblical classification. Plants are not alive according to biblical classification. All these things are complex, self-replicating food sources and they have other functions that they serve for the world but they are not alive okay 
And so animals and things like that, those are alive. But there are things from non-living entities that we can observe and learn things from, but you have to understand that information has been handed down by living beings, meaning that God created those things and God is a living being. So to say that a non-living inanimate force can teach makes no sense. Okay? So being that the Holy Spirit is invisible to the naked eye, what we can do is we could compare it to something like wind or like gravity. Does gravity teach? Does wind teach? No. So in order for the Holy Spirit to teach, it must be a living being. That is, being is the Christian God of the Bible. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses have for a long time, they have taught that the Holy Spirit is an active force of God, but not God himself. And in a book they have called Let God Be True, they state, quote, Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine, end quote. Now that brings me to something I have to pause here to say. We believe in God in three persons. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? But the Trinity doctrine, the term Trinity is not found in Scripture. The Trinity doctrine, actually that term Trinity came from the Catholic Church because they took it from the pagans, okay? What pagans believe and what we believe are two different things. Yes, we believe that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one and three persons at the same time. That's why I call the doctrine God in three persons. But Trinity is Catholic. They believe something different because they have attached themselves, or at least not attached themselves, they have founded themselves on pagan doctrine and tried to merge paganism into the Bible. That's why it's so wicked. And there's an article we have called, Is the Trinity a Biblical Doctrine? And I discuss more about that. If you go to creationliberty.com, type in the word Trinity, T-R-I-N-I-T-Y, that'll get you to that article. And I would read more about that. The article could even be titled, God in Three Persons versus Trinity, and see the difference between those, okay? So that's why in a lot of our teachings, I may have mentioned, said it, you know, in my without my understanding in past teachings. I hope that I didn't. But that's why you'll hear me not say the word Trinity. You always hear me say God in three persons. I avoid using that term because it's pagan. That's it, It's a pagan concept. It came out of the pagans, and the Catholic Church is the one that popularized it. So it's important to understand when they... And then that's why sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses kind of warm up to people like me sometimes is simply because I will say, yes, the Trinity doctrine is pagan, but God in three persons is true. And they're like, okay, well, what is this? And then they start talking about it. And then they realize that, oh, we don't believe the same things. That's right. So when they say the that Satan is the origin originator of the Trinity doctrine, they, and I would say that Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine, we're, we're talking about two different things, okay? The Trinity doctrine is found in paganism, but God in three persons is the truth of Scripture. God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And I'm going to demonstrate that in Scripture. So I don't, I'm, I'm stating that clearly to make sure people don't get the wrong impression from me. I do believe what the Bible teaches. But you have to be careful with how some people phrase these things, because they teach false doctrine. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is in, of any private interpretation, as we just read earlier. Then moving on to verse 21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, what the prophets of the Old Testament were doing were speaking, at least according to 2 Peter, they were speaking as the Holy Spirit instructed them to speak. Now, who was speaking through the prophets in the Old Testament? Let's go back to those Old Testament chapters. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Jeremiah 1, 2. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea. Joel 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. Amos 1.3, thus saith the Lord. So Peter said it was the Holy Ghost, that these prophets spake by the Holy Ghost, and in these places it says that it's the Lord that spake. 
we now have the Lord God and the Holy Spirit being used interchangeably in Scripture. That's not hard to figure out. They are used interchangeably because the Holy Spirit and God the Father are one. And yet, the Jehovah's Witness official website says, in an article they have called, What is the Holy Spirit? Quote, The Holy Spirit is God's power in action, his active force. The Holy Spirit is not a person, end quote. In, it, in the, the book I mentioned earlier, Let God Be True, it says, quote, So the Holy Spirit is the invisible active force of the Almighty God which moves his servants to do his will, end quote. From another book they published called Let Your Name Be Sanctified, it says, quote, In the impersonal, invisible active force that finds its source and reservoir in Jehovah God and that he used to accomplish his will, even at great distances over light years of space, end quote. So you'll see that in the Bible, it will say Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit in capital letters. So the meaning that H and S is capitalized, which puts a proper noun of deity to the name. Jehovah's Witnesses always use it in lowercase letters when writing out Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost because of their removal of the Godhood from the Spirit of God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the apostles were filled with an active force that they could use at will. That's what they believe, which is a lie. That's not true. But even though I may have made a demotivational poster where, you know, this is, it's, a, it's intended to be funny, it is, we also have to take that there is a serious side to this. And what I'm saying about it is that in Matthew chapter 12, Starting in verse 31, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. So, to blaspheme means to revile or speak reproachfully to speak evil or falsely accuse so what it would be in general is whatever is evil and a lie is of the devil so this is to equate that which is of the holy spirit to the devil or that which is of the devil to the holy spirit this is why i tell people who are in the charismatic pentecostal gibberish what they call speaking in tongues that is not speaking in tongues when they do all their satanic gibberish I call it satanic gibberish for a reason. And the last person I t got to talk to face-to-face -to -face about this, he says, oh, that's blasphemy, because I said it was satanic gibberish, because he says that's of the Holy Spirit. Well, I, what I tried to explain to him is reverse that. If what I am telling you is true, then you are guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because you're taking that which is of the devil and calling it of the Holy Spirit. We have to be, that may be part of blasphemy. I don't know how God judges a lot of these matters, okay? I'm just saying, there's a certain part of this we need to take seriously. Because if it's true, that they're going to say, well, the Trinity doctrine, and what they mean by that is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being one, is from Satan? It's possible that that may be blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I don't know. Perhaps God judges separate, separately for people in their ignorance. I, I don't know for sure. But it's something we ought to take with seriousness and that Jehovah's Witnesses ought to be falling on their knees in repentance out of fear of God. It says, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh the word against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be forgiven men because what this is is when the Holy Spirit comes to a person and what they're shown is the grace the mercy the gospel dispensation the things of this that are actually of the holy ghost when they are shown these things and presented these things and they blaspheme against it calling that of the devil that which is of the holy spirit of god directed through man coming to the people and they call that of the devil and they blaspheme against it that's where jesus christ says they they shall neither have forgiveness so it's possible, I mean, that's not what's really happening to all Jehovah's I'm not saying Jehovah's Witnesses can't be saved. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that. I do believe they can. 
and I think they're in ignorance on a lot of this, but I think what they ought to be doing is taking this more seriously than they are. Because one of the things I'll, I'll show you here that's totally absurd is the question, is God in three persons reasonable? Now you could do this with the Jehovah's Witness if you have this quotation, because if we go to Psalm chapter 90, okay, in verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, I've heard them say before, and, and this is from, uh, there's a, the Jehovah's Witness book that they have called Reasoning from the Scripture. They quote from Psalm 90, what I, which is what I just read you, and they pose the question, did God have a beginning? Then they argue the following point, and this is from that book. It says, quote, is that reasonable? They're talking about Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. Is that reasonable? They say, our minds cannot fully comprehend it, but that is not a sound reason for rejecting it, end quote. Now, sound reasoning is rare from Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not that common, but every now and again, they actually make a good argument. And I think this is a good argument. Just because our minds cannot fully comprehend it, that's not a sound reason for rejecting it. However, if Jehovah's Witnesses would judge themselves for five seconds, just because a Jehovah's Witness may not be able to understand how God can present himself in three persons is not a reason to reject it. Because that's what they're doing. I can't comprehend it, therefore I'm rejecting it. Therefore I'm going to say, well, Jesus was a created angel that... Uh, died, re reborn as Jesus, died, reborn as Michael the Archangel again. And the Holy Ghost is just active force, and that way we can all act like Luke Skywalker when we're, when we're praying. That is not reasonable responses to, I don't understand God in three persons. You see what I mean? I don't even understand God in three persons, folks. Me, Chris Johnson, I don't understand it either. I cannot comprehend that because God is beyond my comprehension. That's one of the many reasons he's worth worshiping, is because if he could fit inside of my three-pound brain, he's not as worth worshiping, okay? God is above and beyond those things. Now, I can't always understand it. I've tried to give an analogy. I don't think it's a good one, but it's the best I can come up with of that I am a husband, a son, and a brother. I am all three of those things. It just depends on where I'm being looked at from, right? I am all three of those things, but I am... Somewhat, I'm the same person, but somewhat different depending on whether I'm, you know, like, okay, I'm approaching my wife, I'm approaching my parents, I'm approaching my siblings. I am somewhat different in how I am handling those people in different ways. And I, I don't even know, that's not even a good example. It's just the best I can come up with. I'm one person, but three, at, three, ugh, because that's not even, that's not even the right way to describe it. God is three persons, but he's one God. So... That's the best I can give you. If you want something better, tough. I can't I can't help you, okay? But it's just because I don't understand it is not a reason to reject it and say that I don't believe it. I believe what the Bible teaches. So, I mean, getting back to wind and gravity, can people, I mean, or let's say this, can wind love? Can gravity love? I mean, you normally don't ask these type of questions because they're nonsensical. I mean, everybody knows not to ask questions like that about inanimate objects. What do you mean? Can the chair love? Can the desk have love? Can the desk teach us? You know, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. But Jehovah's Witnesses have to believe it anyway, because they believe in an inanimate force has the type of qualities like love. Like, for example, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Can the wind have faith? Can gravity have faith? Can the wind have joy? Can gravity have joy? Does gravity love? Does wind love? No. <laughs> These things don't happen. But that is what Jehovah's Witnesses, again, are forced to believe because that's the, what the Watchtower teaches them. So for now, I think that's a good place to stop. When we pick up next week, we're going to continue to talk about that. I'm going to give you more examples in Scripture and demonstrate where the Holy Ghost and God are one. I'm going to show you that the Holy Ghost is a person. It's one, it's God. It's one of the three persons of God. We'll talk about some more of the absurd things that Jehovah's Witnesses teach in there. And then we're going to go on, and hopefully next week we'll also start on 
how if somebody is a failed prophet, which is what Charles Russell was, if somebody is a failed prophet, they are a prophet of the devil. They are not sent by God. And we're going to talk about some of the failed prophecies of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Not some of them. There are lots of them. Many of them that you probably don't even know about. And we're going to start talking about that next week. Did anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close? Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week. And may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him and all that you say and do. And God willing, we will see you next week. Mm -hmm.